please sign up on our sign-in sheet there. Uh, we'll add you to our uh, SHPO preservation list. So you'll get announcements like when we have building doctors in, in your area or another building doctor in your area, things like that. So, And also, you have a space on there to sign up for the Historic Preservation Commissions. Well, we're looking for friends of the Historic Preservation okay, Commission. Me, yeah, so if you'd so. like to be on our email list and get um, uh, basically agenda packets that we send out and other information, that'd be great. Okay. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, taking time out of your day to come and uh, listen to what we have to say here today. It's always a, a, a really positive thing for us to get out of Columbus, to get up into the rest of the state, to be in a room full of people who genuinely care about historic buildings and want to do the right thing by them. And so we really view this program, it's public outreach, but I will tell you professionally, it's fulfilling for us too, because we get to meet with like-minded people uh, and talk about old buildings. So let's continue along that route. Um, so Jessica talked uh, about some building materials. We ended with uh, brick and stucco. Talked a lot about water. We're going to continue to talk a lot about water uh, in the second half of the presentation. But probably the most common building material that we run into uh, is, is wood. And like any building material, your goal uh, is to extend the life of that historic material to help preserve your building. So one of the, the uh, uh, key sources of damage to wood is rot, which is caused by a fungus. And uh, it's really a good idea to walk around your building to take a look, and Jessica talked about this in the first half of the presentation as well. Take a look at your site, look for um, areas of wood that are spongy, they're checked, um, we'll see wood that's so heavily deteriorated that you could take a screwdriver or an awl and stick it right through it. Uh, and that is wood that's in pretty bad shape. When you find that, we'll talk in a little bit about ways that you can uh, address that damage. But the real focus needs to be on how do I correct the problem that caused that damage. So. Uh, one thing that can cause damage to wood are insects. Um, frankly, insects are things that you really you just need to hire a licensed professional to deal with an insect infestation. Um, you, there are some basic things you can do. Make your building unappealing. Don't stack a bunch of wood next to your foundation. Um, you can avoid using wood mulches, which insects like. Uh, but if you do have an insect problem, the best way to deal with that is to, to hire a professional. So, um, one thing that people often do when they have wood damage, unfortunately, is they cover it up. And they install a siding, an aluminum siding or a vinyl siding. Um, there are a couple of downsides to siding. This is, this is a Victorian building. Um, it had a lot of detail, had a lot of character at one point. The siding really kind of strips away that detail, kind of eats at the soul of the building a little bit, looks really flat. Um, you know, Victorian buildings were not flat surfaces historically, but this, it really flattens it out. That's an aesthetic issue. The bigger problem is what's happening behind that siding that you can't see. And if you had a moisture problem that caused your wood to rot, and you simply cover the building over with some new siding, the moisture issue hasn't been addressed and you can no longer see the building getting worse. And so in general, siding a historic building is not something that we would recommend doing, both because it has uh, visual impacts, but also because it can hide problems and make them more difficult to, uh, to solve. So we've all heard the, 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 one of the, you know, the, the upsides of, of siding is a, a lesser maintenance than a historic wood clabbered, let's say. 
On the left here, we see uh, an aluminum siding. And you know, aluminum siding, once its initial finish starts to fail, you're still going to have to paint that. Um, on the right, we've got vinyl siding. Vinyl siding can uh, warp and crack with uh, temperature changes. Uh, my son plays hockey. He has broken our vinyl siding on our house <laughs> in about 50 places. Um, you know, nothing is maintenance free. Uh, and so that's just something you want to, to, to think about before you install a product that, you know, one of its primary uh, sales pitches is, you know, a lack of maintenance. Um, nothing is maintenance free. Let's put it that way. So uh, here we have a photo of a decorative bracket from the cornice of an Italianate style uh, building. It's a really good photo to, to underscore uh, different uses of a product called epoxy. And I mentioned that when you have deteriorated wood, it is possible to repair that. Epoxy is really the primary tool that you can, you can use. Uh, in this photo, there are two types of epoxy in play. There's a liquid consolidant that was injected into the browner areas of wood. Uh, it, it, it really helps to pull together a spongy wood. Uh, and then in areas that were missing entirely, those are the white areas that you see. That is uh, a, a, an epoxy putty that is formed to fill the missing uh, pieces, the missing areas of that wood feature. And the putty is really, it's, it's workable like wood. You can sand it, you can paint it, um, and together, you know, not every piece of wood is important enough that you're gonna go to this level of effort to preserve it. But on something like a highly decorative feature like a wood bracket, you know, Jessica mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's the material that makes the building historic. If we replace everything, we're left with a building that looks old but isn't. And so there's an authenticity issue here. Um, and really, these decorative features are the ones that warrant a high level of work to retain. So uh, painting. Painting is hard work. It's not cheap either, uh, but it is probably the single thing that you can do for your wood features on your building to prolong uh, their life most effectively. Paint really, its primary purpose, in addition to beauty and color, it's, it's that it adds a protective layer to the wood elements of your house. So uh, when you are going to paint, the most important thing to do is to determine why your paint that was applied previously failed and to address those issues first. Uh, then you want to check and correct any damage to the wood substrate and make sure you let that wood dry thoroughly before you paint it. If your paint is just dirty or chalking, you can clean it with a bristle brush, some detergent and water, and then rinse it with just a, a, a gentle pressure like a garden hose. Uh, when you're ready to start, you want to protect yourself and your environment. Uh, we strongly encourage you not to utilize uh, any blasting method to remove previous paint. Uh, the slide, the pictures you see on the slide here are an example of, of, of a, uh, a paint job that was applied too quickly after a water blasting was used to remove the previous paint job. And what happened is, is that the water did a, a, a fine job of removing the previous paint. It also got stuck inside the substrate. The paint was applied before it had dried out. The water then tried to leach out and cause that paint to bubble. Believe it or not, these pictures were taken seven weeks after the paint was applied. So that is a really expensive way to learn a lesson. Um, there are plenty of ways to remove paint that doesn't uh, inject a lot of water into your wood. 
Here we see some uh, photos of an infrared paint remover. Um, there are other previous or earlier heating methods, uh, uh, heat guns, let's say. Uh, you got to be really careful. It's wood. It can burn. Your house can catch on fire, right? Um, this is a safer method that tends to, uh, you see on the bottom part of the screen there, that bottom picture, the paint will come off in large pieces, um, which is really nice. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lesser effort than, say, the old tried and true method, which is getting out your scraper and scraping off the paint that has started to fail. Now, this is still a fine way to do paint preparation. Um, you start and work your way towards, uh, from the failing area back towards the sound paint. The key with any paint job is good preparation, and when you use a hand scraper, um, the real key is the sanding that you do after the scraping is complete. Because just as we saw in that previous slide where water was in the wood and then tried to come out, if we don't sand down the ridges that are created from where we scraped and met sound paint, those ridges just serve as a place for water to accumulate and then work themselves in and cause your paint to fail. So sanding from the ridge outward to create a smooth surface, is it a lot of work? Absolutely it is. But if you're going to undertake the effort to repaint your house, you'll, you, you won't regret any effort that you put in to sanding uh, because it will really, really help extend the lifetime of your paint job. So uh, here we've got a few pictures um, on the, uh, uh, the upper left side is a before photo. Uh, and on the lower right is what happened after a fairly detailed effort to um, scrape away. I mean, that's a really, really clean. It, it almost looks like it's newly painted clapper, like it was, you know, fresh from the lumber yard. But that was scraped and painted with a lot of effort going into the prep, but look how clean that surface is. Um, so you've done your prep work. You're actually going to paint. A few basic things about paint. Um, so we know water's not good for paint. Try to not start your job until it hasn't rained in the past three days. Best if it's not going to rain for maybe three days afterwards. Best if the temperature is over 50 degrees. So we're now at about, what, there are 10 days during the year that we could do it and it would be great. Um, those are general you know, guidelines. Um, but again, moisture is not your friend when it comes to a good paint job, uh, nor is cold. And so we need to be uh, as mindful as we can about those environmental factors before we start painting. Uh, a few other basic things. Um, if you apply a latex paint over top of an oil or an alkyd base coat, it's probably going to fail. You can use an oil or an alkyd primer over top of almost anything, and it will do its job as a primer, and then you can apply a latex top coat over top of it. You wanna be careful that you don't apply paint too thickly. Uh, in Jessica's slides, there was talk of, of repointing and not cramming too much mortar in because it'll start to sag. Same thing happens here. If your paint is too thick, um, it will sag and all that effort is wasted. So it's best to apply paint uh, in, in, in fairly thin coats. People like to ask us about color. Um, we don't like to talk about color. Um, 
color is your choice. It's your building. You're, you're investing your time, your effort. Um, you know, the color should be something that you like. Being mindful of the fact that, you know, if you're in a, a, if there's a local district and they have guidelines, you need to be cognizant of them. But that doesn't mean that there aren't ways to find out, you know, what are the historically appropriate colors for my building? A couple of ways to do this, you can go find an area of your building that's really hard to get to, because it's likely that the previous person who painted it didn't go there. <laughs> and um, you can take a sample of that, uh, a paint sample, just get an X-Acto knife, scrape it down to wood, hold that up under a handheld magnifier, magnifying glass, and you will see, uh, in, in basically in section, the history, the paint chronology of the building. This is another example here where they just wet sanded with mineral spirits. This happens to be a sled, believe it or not, um, where um, wet sanding was done in a circular motion to create that, those rings that show you the paint history of that piece of wood. So there are ways that you can fairly easily tell, you know, what were the colors in the history of my building um, you can do a little bit of research yourself to help guide you if you're looking for a correct paint color. Um, okay, so we've talked about wood, we've talked about painting, let's, let's move forward to windows. Um, those of us who do tax credit review would rather <laughs> not move forward to windows. We spend a lot of time talking about details of windows. But I think what the, the key point from a very high level of preservation is simply, you know, windows are very, very important to the character of your building. Um, most buildings, a fairly large percentage of their facade is comprised of windows, and you'd be amazed how much it changes the character of your building when you change a window to a configuration that's different than it was historically, let's say. So while they are, um, th they can be labor intensive to maintain, just like any other piece of historic fabric and perhaps even more so, it's really important to work to retain your historic windows and keep them in sound condition. Some basic things uh, that will help in that regard. You wanna make sure to check the sills of your windows and make sure they have what's called positive drainage. So they're sloped away from the building so that you know that's a natural place for water to land and collect. Um, make sure that the sills slope away from the building to drain that water away rather than towards your historic sash. You wanna make sure that uh, there's caulking uh, around the vulnerable spaces between different materials to help keep the water out of your windows frames. So, um, window work is intense, I'm not gonna lie. Um, Vanessa, back there at the table, literally just got back from a window training where she learned how to do this work on, on metal windows, which is really intense. Um, the key here is there are some things that as building owners, we can venture in and do this stuff. And it's a little scary at first, but there's, it can, it, you can learn it, it can be done. Window work is something that I will stand here and tell you I would hire a professional for. Um, you know, that is, you're working with small pieces of wood in a feature that literally sits in the facade of your building and keeps water from getting in. You can't just go to bed with that project halfway done and not run into a big problem. And so, um, it's not work that's easily undertaken on your own, but it, it, it can certainly be done. And there are people who specialize in it and do a good job. Um, so a window, here we have a, a multi-paned window. All of those panes have, have uh, um, a putty that help hold them in place. That's something that can break down. Uh, it's good to check the window putty and to reapply it if it's failing. Uh, some a, a, a little bit less daunting work when it comes to windows. So historic windows typically operated on a weight and pulley system. 
And oftentimes these sash become non-functional because that system failed simply because a, a, a piece of rope that makes it operate has broken. And a lot of people don't realize that that's pretty easy to fix. So they're in the jam of the window, there's typically an access panel there. It's, it's held in place by a nail or a screw. And you can simply remove that and gain access to the weight cavity. And the, typically, the weight's going to be sitting at the bottom of that weight cavity. And you can simply replace the, the rope that's broken and make your windows operational again. Um, paint tends to build up a lot in the tracks of windows. Obviously, that doesn't help from an operational standpoint. So it's good when you're doing your, your, your paint prep to try and strip as much of that paint as you can out of the jams to help the, the sash move more freely. Um, so it's great to repair windows. Strongly recommend that you repair your historic windows. There will be some windows that can't be repaired, that they're too deteriorated to repair, and you've got to replace that window. The best thing to do is to replace the window with one that matches the historic one. That's setting the bar high. Uh, what we have on the screen are examples of setting the bar very low. Um, these windows, none of these windows even fit the window opening. The window openings have been downsized through the installation of infill um, to allow them to use a standard sized window. And you, know, you, you, you look at this and immediately your mind just processes that the character of the building has been compromised uh, because the windows don't even fit it anymore. It, 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 it looks like something that somebody didn't care enough about to even use the right size windows. And so um, that's not to say that's always easy. You look at the windows on the bottom left corner, and they have an arched upper sash. Um, that's tough. Uh, but on a building on its primary elevation, that's how your building advertises itself to the world. And so um, it, 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 oftentimes, it's, it's very important to choose the right product, find something that fills the opening, and then there are other details that we could talk your ear off about, uh, about you know, sash reveal and, and brick mold size and the like. That stuff in the big picture is less important than my windows need to fit the window openings. Um, here we have on the screen on the left an example of going the extra mile to retain historic fabric. So. In that photo, you've got a, a double hung sash, wood double hung sash, two over two. The upper sash, which is you can only see the bottom portion of it in the picture, that is the historic sash. The lower sash was deteriorated, probably because uh, water pulled at the sill and, and rotted out the bottom rail. And they've replaced just the bottom sash while retaining the upper sash. And you can see the level of match that was done there. That is a very, very sensitive approach. Um, but it also goes to show you that it's not necessarily required to replace all components of a window. Here we have one of two sash that were replaced, and that's a fully functional window sill. On the right is an aluminum clad replacement sash. Um, you know, these are, they offer a higher level of durability because of the aluminum cladding on the exterior face. Still pretty true to the historic sight lines of, of a typical historic window. That's not a bad approach at all uh, in terms of, you know, being compatible and, and, and retaining the historic character of the building. Uh, so let's move on to energy conservation. Uh, nobody likes high electric bills. Um, the nice thing about historic buildings is they often have inherent design features that promote uh, energy efficiency. So in this building, on the bottom left, you can see porch with uh, a, a kind of a, a, a 
broad overhang, uh, the, the awnings that are integral to it, awnings, historic awnings on the upper floor windows. Um, the photo on the upper right, we see transom windows on the inside of the building. You know, those transom windows have a very real purpose. They, they allow air to circulate through rooms. Very often in historic buildings, we had things like pocket doors that allowed us to shut off rooms uh, on a seasonal basis. And so, you know, buildings were built 100 years ago with an, no central air 100 years ago, right? Um, but yet these buildings functioned uh, and they had very intentionally designed features to allow them to function in a way that allowed people to stay warm or cold. Some basics in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, here we've got uh, a window opening where you see dissimilar materials. You've got brick and then wood at the jam of the window assembly. You always want to caulk between dissimilar materials to help uh, keep uh, air and water out. Uh, that's the sort of thing that you'll pick up on and you'll want to take note of during your, your regular building inspections. Oh, and then the bottom right's just showing us weather stripping uh, at the bottom of a door. Again, an, another kind of common sense fix, but one that really helps from an energy efficiency standpoint, weather stripping at doors and windows. Um, these are photos of a building that has aluminum triple track storm windows. Storms are great. Um, they help with air infiltration. Uh, they also help protect your historic sash. You got an exterior storm there. The exterior storm's taking the weather, the wind, the rain, and protecting the wood sash that's behind it. Um, you know, you want to be careful when you're selecting a storm window to make sure that it doesn't significantly cut down on the daylight opening of your window. You don't want the, the framing elements of the storm to be really wide when your window behind it is narrow. That, that will, you might not think much about that, but when you see it in place, you would notice it. Uh, but basic things like framing, you know, you, can, you don't have to take a lot of, uh, of time to find a, a storm that has narrower framing members than the window itself, and they save a lot in terms of the lifespan of the windows that are behind them. Uh, insulation, um, really important. So a building can lose up to 75% of its heat up through the attic, down through crawl spaces and the like. Uh, and so really, if you decide that you want to insulate, it's that up and down is where you want to focus your efforts. You want to make sure that a vapor barrier is always present on the heated side of the insulation. You can use, you know, a faced insulation with craft paper, or you can use a separate plastic sheet. Never insulate between occupied floors of a building. If you are insulating in the attic and the attic is finished, you want to insulate above the finished ceiling, but not cramming so much insulation in that you can't get air circulation above because we saw in Jessica's uh, uh, presentation that air circulation is really important to uh, a, a building's lifespan. If the, if the attic is unfinished, then you insulate in the floor joists above the finished upper floor uh, below the attic. So what happens if our insulation isn't great? Well, this is what happens, especially in Ohio. Um, you know, these are kind of, uh, uh, you know, worst case scenario photos of winter carnage on old buildings that weren't insulated properly. And so, you know, the, the physics of it, hot air rises, your attic isn't insulated properly, the hot air goes up straight to the ridge of the house, snow melts, slides down the sides of the, of the gabled roof, collects and refreezes um, at, the, at, the, at the, uh, the gutters there and create an ice dam. And you know the ice dams are really heavy. They will cause your gutter to fail, which is what you see there in the picture on the lower right. Um, they also, perhaps even more damaging than the gutters falling off, there's nowhere for fresh 
water to drain as that snow melts it backs up behind the ice dam and then works its way through your roof and you've got all sorts of problems with decking and perhaps even rafters and structural members so insulation isn't just necessarily about energy efficiency we're also working on protecting the roof of our building and some bigger picture stuff as well through insulating our attics properly uh, snow guards are great. They help to pace uh, runoff. Unfortunately, snow guards are things that roofers often um, throw out with the old roof. Um, but if you have them and you are hiring roof work done, you know, be sure to tell the roofers that you would like those to be reinstalled because they really do help to pace runoff and avoid the sorts of damage we saw in the previous, previous slides. So uh, we'll talk a little bit here about plaster. Um, here we see a lady who's taking a look at her house, and we've probably all been here before. Um, there's a big crack, and we're trying to figure out how serious is that crack. Um, so let's talk a little bit first about you know, what can cause a crack like that. Typically, um, settlement your building settling will cause cracks oftentimes at the corners of window and door openings. Those cracks tend to be somewhere around a, a 1 16th of an inch thick. Um, if you see cracks at corners and they're not more than 1 16th of an inch thick, keep an eye on it as you do your annual maintenance. If it doesn't get wider or longer, probably just an issue of your building settling in something that has, doesn't need to be actively addressed. Um, if the crack gets bigger, we've got problems. And the problems typically are structurally related and the sort of thing that you're gonna need to bring a structural engineer in to look at to help figure out um, why is my building moving to the extent that that plaster is cracking. So here on the screen, we have um, a really kind of neat slide for building nerds. Um, you know, plaster was applied in three coats historically. You had a scratch coat, a brown coat, and a finished coat. Failure can occur between those coats. Uh, and when that happens, it typically looks like a kind of crazing or alligatoring um, when your plaster fails between coats like that. Um, another reason that plaster can fail is if it wasn't applied liberally enough. Um, here we see historic, um, a historic wall with uh, uh, wood lath that the plaster, uh, and, and on the upper left you're seeing the front of the wall facing the, the, uh, the room itself. The lower right is the rear portion of the wall. and, and understand that plaster was applied in such a way that it pushed through the cracks in the lath and then it it's called keying it keys to the back of the lath and that's what you're seeing kind of that gloppy uh it looks like a mess up here on the screen but that that overflow on the back that wraps around the wood lath is what keeps the plaster in place and so if plaster wasn't applied thickly or densely enough, that keying can fail and then the plaster deteriorates. Water, plaster doesn't like water either. Um, this, is, this puffiness is a telltale sign of moisture infiltration that has compromised the wall behind that plaster. And as it leaches its way out, pushes its way out of the wall itself, uh, it takes the plaster with it in the form of this bubbling and, and puffiness that you see here. The real key when you see something like this, just like it is with painting, it's not gonna do you any good to get rid of that plaster and reapply plaster unless you fixed what caused the moisture infiltration. Otherwise, you're gonna be back fixing it again 
uh, because the moisture will come back and will cause your new, your new plaster to fail. So we see symptoms all the time. The key is to address what's causing them. Uh, here we have uh, a stress crack, and again, movement in the building is typically the cause of, of uh, a, a stress crack. Again, the building could be settling, or you could have something a little bit uh, more uh, sinister, I guess I would say. Perhaps some, uh, a, a contractor was doing mechanical work and made a change to a structural member that you, you know, who's in the basement watching as, as they're running duct work. It, nobody did it intentionally, but if you cut the wrong feature, your building can be structurally compromised. And again, going back to what I talked about before, the goal here is to monitor these cracks and try to figure out whether or not they're getting worse. And if so, do we need to address them? A couple ways to monitor cracks. You can um, simply get out a tape measure, measure their width. You want to be sure to do that at the same time every year because different humidity levels can cause um, shrinkage or expansion. Uh, but if you take the measurement at the same time each year and that number varies, then you've, it's actively progressing. Uh, this on the screen is the old tape method. Just put a piece of tape over there and see if the tape breaks. That's uh, another way to do it that's uh, a little more kind of MacGyver-esque there. Um, plaster itself as, as a material um, is something that, that, you know, mixing up some plasters can be done. Uh, you want to make sure that you that you only mix enough that you can apply it because it will dry and then you'll be stuck if you have extras. Um, and again, it's important that you apply it in thin coats and that you use sandpaper specifically designed for plaster uh, in between coats. That for a small job, it really is just a matter of applying plaster in layers. As you get to bigger jobs, you're, you may have to use like a wire mesh as a lath to give it something to adhere to. And if you have really big areas of plaster failure, let's say you had a roof leak um, and the ceiling in a room has completely degraded, it's fine if that was flat plaster historically, it's fine to simply replace that with drywall um, and you can skim coat it and nobody's gonna know. Plaster can also do things like this. So, you know, there's a big difference between a flat wall and this highly decorative feature that was a ceiling medallion for a light fixture, I believe. Um, plaster can do that. I can't do that. Um, but the material can be made to do that, and there are artisans who can do it. And again, it's an understanding of you know, what is the feature's contribution to the character of your building and what level of effort is it worth? Um, you know, if this, is, if this was the historic feature in the front parlor of your house, which was the building's primary space historically, it's probably worth some effort to try and preserve it. And again, the material allows the recreation of something like that pretty readily. Okay, so let's move on to a discussion of another feature that we find in many historic buildings, which is wood floors. Um, historically, wood floors kind of came in two varieties. There, there were wood floors made from soft woods like evergreens. That's what we see on the, sc on the screen here. Um, they typically have a width of somewhere, well, it's greater than three inches, typically. Um, we also have uh, hardwood floors, which had plank widths of less than three inches. Um, really, with hardwood floors, you know, there are commercial products out there that you just use a Swiffer, you can trap dust. Um, if you need to clean it, you can use a, a weak solution of hot water and white vinegar. Just want to make sure that you dry it off. Uh, obviously, um, wood doesn't like water a whole lot either. But the key, the real key to maintaining your historic wood floors is what we see on this screen. So wood floors had a finish historically. And 
the key to prolonging the life of your historic wood floor is to make sure that that finish doesn't wear off. Because if it wears off, the only way to reapply it is to sand the wood floor. And if you have a wood floor that has a typical thickness of, let's say, an inch, you only get so many sandings out of that before the floor is done and it won't hold together anymore. So it's really important to try to maintain the finish. Um, and on the upper left, you, you see a floor where the finish, um, it, it, it was uh, 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 reapplied before, um, before it had deteriorated to the point where sanding was necessary. On the lower right, you see a floor where that finish has not been maintained. And the only way that that's going to be addressed is through sanding, which again, it's, it's fine. It's, it's fine as a preparation in advance of applying a new finish, but it will cost you some of the depth of your historic floor. Uh, yeah, there are lots of over-the-counter kind of standardly available products to help you care for your historic floors. Let's talk uh, about building systems, which, um, you know, when we, Jessica talked at the beginning about restoration and rehab. Look, the real world here is nobody's going to inhabit a building that doesn't have modern systems. And so our buildings have to accommodate these systems. And our job as the owners of these buildings is to try to install them in a way that is as sympathetic as possible to the, the character defining features of our buildings. So here we have some examples. Well, actually, let me go back to that previous slide because this is, what we're trying to show here is there is, there are modern pieces of equipment that are industry standard at this point that allow us to make historic buildings um, functional in, in, in the modern world that it's no great um, sacrifice. It doesn't cost a whole lot of extra money because you're in a historic building. Um, you know, you can buy a more energy efficient furnace and install it. You can buy a new boiler to connect to historic radiators and keep them functional if you'd like. There are very easy ways to make historic buildings functional with today's systems. Um, and then we have slides that show us that sometimes people don't do the best things by their historic buildings um, and don't make the best choices about uh, doing things in a way that is generally considerate of their character. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, we always tell people that this does this building is not in Ohio, so we are absolved of uh, <laughs> uh, of this. But yeah, this <laughs> this is uh, in Indiana, I believe. Um, so the you know, you can see here we've got ductwork running from the roof uh, down through the window on the building's primary elevation. It almost looks like another column. Um, inside the building, the owner figured out that the arched uh, 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 windows above the doorways were convenient places to blast ductwork through. Then in order to conceal all that, they dropped a ceiling and you know changed the height of the building's central corridor by four feet. Um, and on the bottom right, we've got a photo where somebody cut through a foundation wall to make it a little bit faster and quicker and, and less linear feet to run ductwork. So we're probably going to be having the discussion about plaster cracking right above that area uh, in the future. Um, we've got to be cognizant of important design features when we're looking at uh, building systems. It's fine to drop the ceiling to conceal ductwork if you're in a space that has a 10-foot ceiling and it was flat plaster historically, and you're going to give up two feet of it to get down to an 8-foot ceiling to give yourself plenum space to run you know, a 16-inch duct, let's say. 
But what happens if your historic ceiling is what you see on the bottom left? You know, or do we want to cover that to conceal ductwork? Or do we want to think, wow, maybe I could run that ductwork in the basement and have it come up through the floor so that I don't give up views of my pressed metal ceiling? Um, there are typically multiple ways that you can run systems in any given space. And some spaces um, require a little bit more thought about ways to do things sympathetically. Um, on the upper right, you've got a photo of a, a duct running exposed. You know, that's a tough space to run, to run uh, duct work in because look, if you drop the ceiling to conceal that duct work, it's gonna be below the head of the window. And you know, that's gonna significantly compromise the volume of that room. Um, it's going to read from the outside of the building through the window. That's not great. So this is really an example of a place where it might be best if you can't run it um, in a soffit held farther back from the window. Maybe you leave that exposed and paint it out just so that you don't change the, the overall volume of the space. But again, it is quite typical to be able to run systems in things like soffits and chases which is the soffits are what you see on the two upper photos. You can see uh, the, the, um, the registers in the wall. They're feeding conditioned air into the room through those soffits. The bottom picture is a picture of a chase that's built out in a corridor between two doorways. You got to look twice to even know it's there. Uh, and that is, that's facilitating a modern system uh, running throughout the building. The mechanical components themselves, uh, we want to try to locate them in places where they aren't visually intrusive. So upper left, you've got it in a basement. Upper right, they're at the rear of the building. You can see that little pathway leading to the front. Nobody's going to see those things back there. Uh, the, bottom, or the bottom picture is a, a, a mechanical unit that was placed in an attic. Uh, to feed the second floor uh, ductwork running to the second floor below. Um, again, uh, Jessica mentioned vents on the outside of the building. Uh, vents are pretty, there's lots of different options. Uh, and typically these days, they don't cause a lot of problems. Uh, and so uh, not really a whole lot of point in spending a lot of time on that. Um, so we've talked about different building materials. We've talked about um, different building components. Uh, the goal is simply to work to preserve our historic buildings. Um, whether you do the work yourself or you hire a contractor, our goal is to simply help convey information that helps you preserve your historic buildings. So we've seen projects that are big, like this one in Cincinnati, where you had the before condition on the upper left and the after condition on the upper right. And then we see that preservation works for small projects too. Um, the information is out there. We are a resource for you. We are never more than a phone call away. Uh, we love talking to members of the public, helping you solve your problems, and giving information. You, you guys own historic buildings. You love them. You're putting the work into them. You deserve all of the credit. We have knowledge. We're happy to help you in any way we can. Uh, and coming out here and giving this presentation is one of the ways that we do it. So we really appreciate you attending tonight. Um, and questions, we're happy to stick around and answer any questions you may have. Uh, clearly, we'll see you on site visits tomorrow for those of you that are signed up. Uh, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to fire away. At the back. Uh, the rhino paint that they're putting on buildings now, do you recommend that? Or is that going to capture moisture? It's a great question. I think you answered your own question. <laughs> your own question. So any any time I see something like that, my concern is one, it's kind of elastomeric and very thick. 
and is it going to trap moisture behind, like what's its breathability is, is my first question. Because we didn't talk today in a specific sense, but just know old buildings were meant to breathe. Okay, the idea of being airtight is a very modern thing for modern systems. It is not a historic thing. And so your buildings naturally air moved in and out. Um, water is going to get in one way or another. And it's just like the slide Jessica showed on, on, on why we don't recommend uh, applying a, a, a sealant or a, a moisture kind of guard on the interior face of your foundation. You know, water is going to work its way from the, the ground outside your building into your foundation wall, and then it can't get through. And what happens to your foundation then as a result of having moisture trapped in it? Any, anything that's thick, viscous like that, I get nervous. And then I, I would go back to the slide that I showed about the, the siding. You know, we ran into this with, with um, uh, uh, the paint that was applied to, to basically cover over lead paint surfaces 15 years ago or so. It's necessarily thick in order to do its job. How much detail are you losing through the application of that? That that would those would be my general concerns. So you don't really know for sure about the right? I I don't have familiarity with the specific product. I would say I'm inherently skeptical about the whole line of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Vanessa is sitting right behind you, and I'm sure she would be happy to talk with you afterwards. Sure. Chris. Good question. So um, when you're doing lead paint, asbestos, yeah, these are dangerous materials, um, and we need to be careful when we're doing them. And really, when you're when you're doing them, you have to meet certain safety requirements and disposal requirements. And you shouldn't be working on these things without breathing apparatus, with filters and the like. Uh, you need to wear personal protection that protects you. There's a reason why these are hazardous materials that people are trying to get out of buildings. Um, and, and it's fine, and we do. You saw our, our, our presentation focused on, you know, their danger is when they're friable. If they are, if they're sound and in good condition, there's no need for you to disrupt it and make them friable. But lots of buildings have friable um, asbestos or lead and when you remove them, absolutely, this is not something you just, you know, do in a pair of jeans and a T-shirt. It's, it's, you need to be wearing, again, proper safety gear, breathing apparatus, and the like. I'll say with, um, with asbestos, I did a little bit of research on that a while ago. There are Ohio's, um, I believe, Department of Health has a really great, if you just search like Ohio certified asbestos removal, there are contractors that are certified in asbestos removal, properly um, encapsulating it, removing it so that the little fibers that may come if you break it, don't fly all over the air, and then proper disposal of that. So that's definitely asbestos is definitely something that I don't recommend doing yourself. One second, we'll go over here first. Absolutely. It could be in what's called the mastic, the, the glue substance that was used to adhere it. Asbestos was a very common building material, especially in the early 20th century. And so um, it's certainly something we need to be cognizant of as, as old homeowners. Um, and also know the reality is, is that when you contract with someone to dispose it, that's not stuff that goes to the landfill. There, there is a premium involved with getting that removed because there are specific requirements for its disposal. 
Yes. How would I get information on the age and manufacture location of the brick of my class? So if you're lucky, um, you have bricks that are stamped. Doesn't happen all the time. Uh, but typically, if you're talking about, let's say, an early 20th century home, more often than not, your brick was going to come from a fairly local brick manufacturer. And so knowing something about the history of, of brick manufacturers in the area is going to be the best place for you to start. Not often are those manufacturers necessarily still around. Uh, and so th the short answer I would tell you as a realist the likelihood that you're going to find the same brickyard still operational making the same brick is exceedingly low. But there are plenty of brick makers out there who can match just about anything, including ones in Ohio. Uh, and so if you have a brick and you want it matched, there are brickyards out there that will work to match it. Um, but again, know that early 20th century, 19th century, the, the world was a much bigger place and building materials tended to come local. Can I add something to that? Sure. There's a Facebook group called Buckeye State Made Bricks. I look on that. There's a Facebook group for everything. Yeah. And it's called, it's called Buckeye State Made Bricks. Yeah. And they regularly, they're guys they're mostly men. They collect bricks made by different kilns in Ohio, and they show them off on Facebook. Yep. So that might be a source too. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm wondering, um, I have um, a house that has light brick, kind of a light sandy color. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, it's mostly where the water runs. It's just gotten discolored. Where it runs. Is there anything that works kind of just in those areas? I don't do the whole house. Sure. Just looking a spot clean brick, you think? You think? Mm -hmm. Light dish soap and a bristle brush. Just kind of gently kind of scrub at it. You know, you're not going to get all of this coloration off because if it is a light sandy brick, like my white t-shirts, if I stain them, they're kind of stained forever. I could do as best I can to get them out, but they're still a little dirty. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say water and a light dish soap. I wouldn't really go anything stronger than the light dish soap in my, you know, my humble opinion. And just like a bristle brush or a... a toothbrush even or something and just kind of rub at it and then rinse it off and kind of maybe repeat a few times. It is a little, from a color standpoint, it's a little less forgiving than your typical dark red brick in terms of hiding that stuff. On a dark red brick, we would look at that and say it's patina. On a, <laughs> on a buff brick, you look at it and say it's dirty. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, you know, that's, but Jessica's right. Um, typically, you could, you don't even you can start without the detergent and you can simply use a low pressure water and a natural bristle brush and that may be enough, but go, moving to a, a detergent is fine. Once you start getting into chemical products, you're gonna want to do test patches and make sure that they're not more harmful to your brick than they are good. But odds are, if it's just dirt accumulation from water runoff, that is, that should come off with the fairly light um, application. Yeah. Yes. What's your opinion of uh, gutter guards, gutter caps, leaf guards? Th that's one product that I'm happy to tell you. A lot of this newer stuff, preservation is inherently skeptical of. Um, advancements in technology. We like traditional building, <laughs> traditional building products, 20 years of performance to prove that there isn't some unintended negative side effect, but a gutter guard, what's that going to hurt? Like all it does is keep leaves out of your gutters and keeping leaves out of your gutters helps drain your building. That sounds good to me. And so like they, as I understand their installation, it's not like it um, compromises historic fabric or is is um, so intensive that it requires, you know, blasting holes in the in, in your fascia or anything like that. And so, to me, what's most important is facilitating functional drainage of your building. And if that does it, and it doesn't really have a, a negative visual effect, I say go for it. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you're cleaning it. Get those leaves off of it. 
And I had some of those gutter guards. I had gutter guards. It depends on the kind of gutter guard. It depends kind of on the kind of leads you have. If you have big leads, it's great. If you have those bearing locust trees like you have in my yard, those kind of things, it becomes more of a problem. I, I, I've kind of given up. I mean, this is not an, an endorsement or a criticism of gutter guards. Just pay attention to the kind of leads you want to get out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a little tiny locust tree things, and they get in. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, so locally, we don't have um, a resource list of um, people that are suitable for working on our old houses. So, um, do you have uh, a resource list? I wish I could answer that question in the affirmative, but we we. So we are um, hamstrung by the fact that we receive a lot of funding from the state and federal government, and we aren't allowed to promote one thing over another, and that extends to contractors. We do have a partner organization. There's a statewide nonprofit called Heritage Ohio um, who... Uh, Every time I give this presentation, this question comes up, and I think, I need to call Heritage Ohio and see if they're operating a list like that yet. Um, they, they don't have the same limitations, uh, and Andy's giving me the thumbs up. So they, they, they do have a list like that. Now, keep in mind, they're, in mind, they're a statewide organization, um, but I'm sure there is somebody in northwest Ohio uh, on that list. Let's put it that way. But I think it's fair to say, suffice it to say that as staff, one of our biggest concerns is we get that question at literally every building doctor that we do, and we understand why. You know, there are lots of contractors out there who do work. There aren't lots of contractors out there who do work on historic buildings knowledgeably. And frankly, the longer we go, the fewer of them there are. Uh, and there's all sorts of reasons for that, but you know, hopefully more people caring about their buildings coming to a presentation like this. If there's a market, the, the, the people will follow. Uh, and so, um, I would love, I, I'm just, I'm happy to be able to tell you Heritage Ohio will help you with that. Um, cause it's a real need. Vanessa. It's on their website. If you go to their website, um, heritageohio.org and if you go to consultants database you can search by height you can search by zip code you can search by all these different things cool spectacular Thanks. yes is it okay to paint over brick was it painted before so we don't really recommend that because that's going to again create that barrier where moisture is going to be trapped so we don't we don't always recommend it. Is it the worst thing to happen to brick? Not entirely. I mean, a typical latex paint is going to have a breathability quotient that's it, it, it'll be okay. It's it's not we're not talking about a, a really viscous application. Um, but I guess the, the 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 question to me is why. Um, if the brick has survived a hundred years, what's the need to paint it? Um, now we saw dramatic examples of why paint was applied to buildings historically. Uh, but if, if your building wasn't painted historically and it's lasted this long, the quality of the brick is such that it doesn't probably need to be painted. And you know, the character of the building historically was that brick was exposed. And you know, we're going to default to we want to work to preserve the historic character, so I would recommend leaving it unpainted. Any other questions? Well, again, we we can't thank you enough for coming out. It's this is you know it's a lot of people on a rainy Thursday night to learn about old buildings. It makes us happy to, ha to have this many people here wanting to learn. And just know, again, you've got packets. Our contact information is in there. You know, we are the State Historic Preservation Office. We are here as a resource for the people of Ohio. If you have questions, 
call us. If you can't tell, I like to talk. So um, I'm happy to talk with you. If you have questions, by all means, send us an email, give us a phone call. We'll, we'll be happy to chat. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs>